Fun fact, did you know that the biggest buy-in tournament I've ever played was only 100,000 pounds, and I bubbled it. I had aces on the bubble, and I lost. <sighs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com, here today with episode 347 of Weekly Poker Hand. Today we're reviewing a hand from High Stakes Poker. They are playing some pretty high-stakes games. Over at Poker Go, make sure you check that out. Today we're playing 400, 800, no limit, Texas style. And here, Brandon Steven raises it up under the gun with pocket eights to $2,300. That may sound like a lot of money, but he's only about three big blinds. Brandon Steven is a world-class business professional, also plays a ton of poker. He's a family man. He does it all. Good job. Good work. Congrats on the great balance. He opens it up. Tom Duan in the low jack seat with ace seven of clubs decides to call, which I think is perfly fine. You're gonna find that when you are playing very deep stacked, as these players are, they're playing, goodness gracious, 400 something big blinds deep. The suited aces and any hands that can realistically make the nuts usually go up in value a decent amount because if you do happen to make a flush against the flush or trips with top kicker against trips with worst kicker, etc., you stand to win a whole lot of money. So the suited aces are very, very solid hands to play, and Tom Dwan does splash around with it. Bryn Kinney in the small blind opts to raise it up, well, re-raise it up, to $12,000 with pocket jacks. Bryn Kinney is the number one all-time leader in tournament winnings with $56 million. He wins all the big tournaments, including the million-pound buy-in Triton Poker Million. Fun fact, did you know that the biggest buy-in tournament I've ever played was only 100,000 pounds, and I bubbled it. I had aces on the bubble, and I lost. Rick Solomon, in the big blind, opts to cold call with pocket kings. All right, I'll give you a little bit of advice here. Whenever it goes raise, call, three bet, and then you cold call, even playing very deep stacked. This is almost always a spot that you don't really want to be in. You'd usually rather just put in the re-raise with your best hands and fold everything else because sometimes what's going to happen is Brandon Steven is going to re-raise and make it 40,000 or whatever and then that's going to put Rick in a pretty nasty spot with all of his non-premium hands and also with Rick's premium hands he just wants to get money in the pot right like with Kings you don't really care if you make the pot big especially against a loose aggressive battling player like Bren now as you do get deeper and deeper stacked you will start to see some cold calls from a GTO point of view but I do think that you probably just want to get in there and apply aggression with your best hands, and you probably don't want to be calling all that often in this spot. The only time you could really justify calling here is if you know Bryn Kenny is really, really tight and only re-raises here with the nuts, but that's not the case. Bryn's a very, very strong tournament player. He gets in there and he battles. I have extensive GTO charts at my training site, pokercoaching.com. You can use your phone and check them out anytime when you're traveling, commuting, before the hand starts, and... If you make sure you understand all the common spots you're going to be in, that's going to go a long way to making sure you are not making errors. I'm actually having a sale right now. You can check that out at pokercoaching.com slash patties. It's St. Patrick's Day, so get in there, get the discount, and take a look at the deep stacked GTO cash game charts that we have. To be fair, we don't have charts for 600 big blind deep cash games. I don't think I've ever even played 600 big blind deep cash games. Eh, that's not true. I used to at Bellagio sometimes. But... Uh, we do have charts up to 200 big blinds deep, and uh, a pretty neat spot you'll see is that in this scenario, you should just continue re-raising and putting money in the pot. Because imagine in this scenario, Rick Solomon does make it 32,000. If it gets back around to Brent Kenny and he makes it 80, you can still call, see the flop, go from there, and um, you know probably not end up folding. While you're not trying to get 600 big blinds in necessarily, you still do want to get value and extract get value from worse hands, and if your opponent folds out something like, you know, ace-queen, that's fine. Anyway, now what's going to happen is Brandon Stevens going to call, Tom Dwan's going to call, and we're going to see a four-way flop, and a lot of people look at this and say, oh no, King saw the flop four ways, this is terrible, but it's not actually the end of the world as long as you realize that you're not going to have the best hand a lot of the time after the flop. What a lot of people do wrong in Rick's shoes is they slow play here, and then they see a flop, whatever it is, and then they just always put their money in. And you got to realize, at this point, the Kings is trying to play a medium-sized pot. If a lot of money goes in post-flop, Kings are usually in pretty bad shape when you see a three or four or five-way flop. So recognize in the scenario, when you do just call the Kings, if you do decide to do that, that 
you're not always trying to put your money in post-flop. Flop comms, ace-8-8. Eight, eight. Goodness gracious, what an action board. Here, Brent Kenny, the re-raiser, has a solid underpair. Rick has a solid underpair, both of which are pretty garbage at this point, by the way. When an ace is on the flop, they're in pretty bad shape. Brandon Steven has, how many aces does he have? One, two, three, four eights. He has quads. And Tom Dwan has the top pair. Brandon Kenny's going to check. This is an unfortunate spot where you re-raise and then a bunch of people call. When you re-raise with a hand like Jackson, and a bunch of people call and it comes ace XX, you're just done. Check, check. Brandon Steven with quads has to figure out what to do in this scenario. He has four of a kind. What I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and write in the comments section below what you would do with four eights in this situation. Plus $48,000. Would you check it in slow play? Would you bet tiny, like 12,000? Would you bet medium, like 30,000? Or would you bet big, like 48,000? Pause the video below and write what you would do. All right, did you do it? Great. This is a spot where even though you want to get money in the pot, even though we are super deep stacked, I think the play is probably to just check. Because once Bryn checks the flop, that kind of announces he doesn't have a premium hand. At best, Bryn has a bad ace here most of the time. He may randomly have some nut hand, but with, when you have the eights in your hand, it's very, very unlikely he has the nuts. And if he does happen to have like pocket aces, you're going to be able to get all the money in anyway. So we don't really think Bryn has much. If Rick had a good ace, he would probably bet. So Rick is also very capped, right? If Tom Dwan had a good ace, ace, king, or ace, queen, he'd probably just re-raise the port before the flop, right? So everyone probably has a very marginal hand. And in this scenario, they're all just drawing dead, right? So this is a spot where, yes, you're highly incentivized to try to make the pot big, but your opponent's ranges are probably going to be pretty weak to the point that you just can't make the pot big because they're going to fold. So I think this is a spot where Brandon Steven just wants to check. He does check. And now Tom Duana has decided if he wants to bet. I think this is a fine spot to throw a small bet out. If you bet small, notice that if pocket kings or pocket jacks calls, you extract a little bit of value. Um, yes, no better hand is going to fold, but I do think worse ace X can call. And you may even get called by a hand like pocket jacks or pocket kings if you throw out a 13,000 bet in this scenario. And if you pick up the pot, that's fine too, because whatever they're folding has little bits of equity. So I don't mind a small bet from Tom Duan. Let's see what he does in the spot. He does go for the small bet, 13,000. I like this play. Brent decides to call, and eh, this is a little bit splashy. If you remember the one of the previous episodes of Weekly Poker Hand, we had a eulogy for Tom Dwan because the old Tom Dwan that's running lots of insane bluffs is dead. We'll have the eulogy next Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will see you at his tombstone. Moment of peace. Rest in peace, Tom Dwan. New Tom Dwan seems to be a little bit more tight and aggressive. I'm not going to say you should definitively fold these pocket jacks, but it's a dicey spot. The nice thing about jacks here, when we are super deep stacked, is that if you do get a jack, you have very solid implied odds. Normally, you're not calling with jacks. You're thinking, all right, if I get a jack, I'm going to win a gigantic pot. But when you are really, really deep stacked, there are still some implied odds to make your full house. That said, if he makes a full house here, he's going to be in big, big trouble. All right, Rick Solomon does fold the kings. Notice here, Rick Solomon does a great job post-flop. If you are going to play the kings like this pre-flop, just check fold the flop. Good job, good work. A lot of people in this scenario get married to their hand and they lose all their money. And now Brandon Steven with quads again. <laughs> Do we put in the raise now? Nah. The only time you can put in the raise here is if you know that Tom Dwan thinks that his range is going to appear weak to you. And he thinks that you're going to be willing to get way out of line and try to take advantage of it. So essentially, Brandon needs Tom to think that Brandon is loose and aggressive and badly. Does he think that? I don't think so. Brandon is active pre-flop, but I don't think he runs too many insane bluffs post-flop. And also he has to worry about Brent having a hand like ace, queen or something that, that played it a little bit slow. So this is a spot where I, I don't think you can put in the raise. The problem though is that if you do elect to just check call, you're going to have a really, really tough time getting a lot of money in the pot later. Because right here when Tom does bet with an ace, say he has ace, queen or ace, jack or something, he's got to worry about Brent Kenny randomly checking ace, king. And he has to worry about Brandon randomly having 
ace-king as well, or even an eight. So it's just going to be hard for Brandon to play a big pot. It's always annoying when it's hard to play a big pot, but sometimes that's how it goes. So he does call. I don't know. I'm trying to think if you should just put in a raise here. I guess I don't I, I don't even know what to do. To be fair, I am not the best 400 big blind deep po tournament, uh, poker player in the world. So uh, who knows what you're supposed to do. Turns a queen. Check. Brandon checks. Easy check for Tom Dwan here. This is the problem with check calling the flop, right? Is that when your opponents don't have good hands, you just can't play a big pot. The thing is, though, is that even though you have quads here, you just can't get to play a big pot. All right. Check, check, check. River is the 10 of clubs. So the board is ace, eight, eight, queen, 10. Brand checks again. Now Brandon has to decide if he should check or if he should bet. And I definitely like a bet here. If Tom has ace X, like he does, which I do think is a very, very likely hand for him to have, he's just going to check it back on the river because it's too easy for Bren Kenny to have ace king or a weaker ace that's just going to very, very easily check and call, right? Um, Bren could also even be sitting here with like ace queen or ace 10 playing it a little bit slow. Could he randomly, could either play a randomly of king jack? Eh, probably not. It was a small flop bet. If you have king jack of spades or something, maybe that's okay to check call flop. But you're not worried about the king jack so much. You are just worried about if you bet here, no one's folding an ace. And um, that that's going to result in Tom Dwan not betting the river. So because Tom is very rarely going to bet the river, I do think Brandon just needs to bet the river. And I think he wants to bet pretty big uh, because you're trying to get called by an ace, right? If your opponents have worse than an ace, say they have pocket kings or say they have pocket threes they're not going to call any bet in this scenario so if you are going to bet here you want to be betting very polarized the problem though that brandon steven has is that he doesn't really have very many bluffs like what bluffs make logical sense at all remember he checked called the flop after it went bet and call so i mean brandon needs to be turning a hand like pocket fives or pocket jacks into a bluff or pocket nines is he really turning those into a bluff? I'm not sure. I mean, seriously, try to come up with bluffs here. There really aren't a whole lot of logical bluffs, right? Because if you give Brandon Steven queen jack of spades, he's just going to check fold the flop, right? So he basically has no bluffs. It's a nasty scenario. Um, when you have no bluffs, you got to look really, really hard for them. And I don't even know if pocket nines calls. I guess pocket nines would check the flop and then call a small bet, kind of like Brent Kenny called the small bet on the flop. I guess that's reasonable. But even then, that's that's kind of a stretch, right? Maybe, maybe Brandon's supposed to turn low ace X into a bluff. That could actually be pretty sweet. Like imagine he has ace two and decides to blast it using his ace as a blocker to try to get the opponent off of all the chops. Maybe even ace king race, maybe ace king race 10 volts. That could be reasonable. Weird spot, right? All right. In this scenario, what would I do? I would bet big. I mean, <laughs> I would just bet big. You have, you have a very good hand. And if your opponent does have an ace, they're probably going to call. That said, we already knew Tom Dwan was dead. Tom Dwan folds. The top pair, I actually think this is a good fold. Not because Brandon has the eights, but because, like I just said, find bluffs, right? It's essentially impossible to find bluffs for Brandon here unless he's turning ace X into a bluff or he decided to play pocket nines like this or pocket kings like this and decided to bluff it, which I think is also kind of optimistic. So I, I like the fold a lot here from Tom Dwan. This is, this is a solid play. And then, of course, Brandon's just going to fold. I hope. Maybe he rips it in. You think Brandon's going to go all in? No, 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 no. Bren, Bren just folds as well because this is a spot, like I said, where it's very, very hard for Brandon to be bluffing. And it turns out he was not bluffing at all. He had one, two, three, four, eights. Eights are great. So that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. If you did, do me a quick favor and click the like and subscribe buttons below as well as the notification bell. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great week. Thank you very much for being here. Make sure you check out the St. Patrick's Day at PokerCoaching.com. We are giving you all sorts of value there. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash patties. Have a great week.